Hello and welcome back to the Scottish Parliament virtual meeting. The, we're going to resume on the subject of health and sport, and our first question is from Emma Harper. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. My question is for Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Um, Cabinet Secretary, today's Financial Times is reporting that NHS Works, which is NHS England's digital service, there's, no, is, there's nobody on it upstairs, please. NHS oh. is considering shifting from the tracing that it has developed to use the one being developed by Google and Apple. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise if the Scottish Government has been made formally aware of this potential change in the app by the UK Government? No, we haven't. So, Cabinet Secretary for Health? No, we haven't. Emma Harper? Thank you, President Officer. Um, yes, a short answer from Cabinet Secretary. Um, what action then can be taken in order to um, uh, request a more formal update from the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. So the same action as we have been taking to try and get the information we need about the uh, NHS England proximity app. Uh, as I said, I think in the chamber earlier this week, possibly on Tuesday, uh, we still are waiting information from NHS England on the technical information we need on that app. In other words, to understand exactly how it will work and how the data that it gathers will feed into our uh, NHS Scotland system, and secondly, on the ethical and data security questions that are uh, important in order to ensure users that it is safe to do so. Um, as I said then, if we then, on receipt of that information, feel that the app will enhance our own approach, we would, of course, want to use it. But we have not had that information. We have not had information about anything that is reported in today's media. So we will continue to press the UK government for that. Thank you. Miles Briggs to be followed by Monica Lennon. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, this is a question for the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Um, has any national guidance been given on what cancer diagnostic tests um, and treatment can currently take place within COVID-free sites? Or is this a, de a decision currently being taken by health boards and regional cancer centres? Cabinet Secretary. So the Cancer Clinical Network will have provided guidance to uh, clinicians who are treating patients with cancer or with suspicion of cancer uh, about the uh, guidance that they should be following to take account of the risks associated with COVID-19 in the clinical decisions that they then reach uh, and the conversations they then have with patients about what uh, they might do. So urgent cancer care continues, but in some uh, individual cases, clinicians take the view uh, and discuss this with the patient that the risk associated to that individual and all the circumstances that may surround that individual's case, uh, in those circumstances, the risk of uh, acquiring COVID-19 outweighs uh, the risk of postponing the procedure for a specific period of time. And of course, that guidance is updated constantly and is one of the areas that we look at as we look at uh, restarting areas of our health service. The brief supplementary from Miles Briggs. Um, thank you, President Officer. Could you um, outline, Cabinet Secretary, what the current capacity within COVID free sites across Scotland is then for cancer diagnostic tests and treatment? Uh, not. Uh, so not directly at this point. I'm happy to uh, check that information and provide it to Mr. Briggs. Uh, what we do know is that we created uh, 3,000 bed capacity and uh, for COVID-19 patients, and uh, not all of that is currently being used. We also diverted a number of staff uh, in order to assist with rotors uh, for other staff uh, working in uh, COVID-19 areas in respiratory wards and also to train up more staff so that they could um, cover for rotas in intensive care. And as you'll know, we have quadrupled our intensive care 
capacity to 585 at surge. That is the current surge capacity. We continue to work towards quadrupling uh, that number, uh, but at the moment, uh, 15 per cent of that ICU capacity is used as of the figures reported today. Thank you. Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My question is also for the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Um, Cabinet Secretary, earlier this week you said that the Scottish Government's campaign to get people to come to the NHS is working. I wonder if you can provide an update on the, the latest figures for urgent cancer referrals since we heard about the dramatic drop of, of 70 per cent um, last month. And also, um, you might not have heard, but this morning, Professor Linda Bald was giving evidence to the COVID-19 committee, and she advised that she believes that, that cancer screening should be restarted. Um, can you give an update on that, Cabinet Secretary? And if you agree with, with Professor Bald that providing COVID-free environments uh, and also making sure there's adequate PPP for, for staff and patients could be part of that, that solution to get people back to work? Cabinet Secretary. So, of course, I, I absolutely agree that adequate PPE for staff is vital in the clinical areas that they are working on, and members will be very familiar of, uh, on all the work that we have done on that, particularly uh, committee members, health and sport committee members, since we had a session on that this morning. I regret I cannot provide you those, with those figures. Uh, it, without having questions in advance, then it is not possible for me to provide accurate figures in response to questions. Uh, but we will undertake to uh, secure those figures and pass them to you where we have them. On the question of uh, increasing uh, the uh, level of cancer work, of course, uh, urgent suspicion of cancer has uh, not been paused as a consequence of the current pandemic. Uh, but perhaps equally importantly, uh, a significant amount of work is now underway to look at what we might restart. Uh, using uh, the current situation, in as much as we can continue to uh, keep the R number as far below one as possible, and as you'll know, our current estimate is that it is at best 0.7. So that remains insufficiently below uh, one for us to have confidence in easing lockdown measures at this point. Uh, but part of easing also includes restarting those areas of the health service, uh, which we can do without um, risking the capacity that we do need to keep, should there be an increase in COVID-19 cases. And a brief supplementary again from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary does not have those figures at her fingertips, but if she is um, willing to provide a, a written answer to me or to the rest of the Chamber, that would be great. Macmillan um, Cancer Support have today raised me concerns about um, people from more deprived communities and, and what those figures might be telling us. So as well as the, the update on urgent cancer referral, would the Cabinet Secretary also agree to give a further breakdown by areas of deprivation of people who have been referred in the last month? In uh, I'm certainly happy, more than happy, to agree to look at that. Uh, breaking down those figures in that way is, of course, uh, a significant task. And as I'm sure uh, Ms. Lennon appreciates, a very large proportion of my health officials and many from elsewhere in government are currently working on the, all the areas of the pandemic, including uh, the options to uh, restart areas of the health service that have been paused. And our analysts, of course, are very highly involved in the modelling work that we undertake consistently. So, um, I will certainly be able to supply the first set of figures uh, that I have agreed to, and I am happy to look at what more we can do and to advise Ms Lennon of that as we go. Thank you very much. Alison Johnson to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Health and care workers have a high risk of infection. Experts are calling for data on the long-term health effects. And a global debate on compensation for these workers is taking place. I believe that Belgium has added COVID-19 to its list of prescribed occupational diseases. What modelling is the Scottish Government undertaking on the long-term health effects on health and care workers 
And will COVID-19 be classed as a compensatable occupational disease in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So on, on the last part of that question, uh, I am unsure at this point, but I will find out uh, who is responsible for the classification of occupational diseases and uh, advise the member of that. In terms of looking at the long-term health effects, uh, work is underway looking at the long-term health effects of COVID-19 on patients. Uh, that would be all patients. As you know, there is some evidence emerging of a longer-term effect on patients who uh, survive the, the virus but are left with uh, longer-term impacts in terms of uh, their lungs and their respiratory system and, to a degree, their venal system. Uh, now, it is early days in that research work, but it is underway. Um, Nine Wells Hospital, in particular, is uh, actively engaged in the respiratory area, um, and all of that will inform uh, our uh, forward decisions, um, not only in how we restart areas of our health service, but whether or not there will be new or additional demands in areas of health care that we currently provide. Now, I believe Alison Johnson wants a supplementary question. Yes, yes, I, I appreciate that response. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary know how many health and social care workers have contracted COVID-19 in Scotland and how many at this stage have moderate to severe effects from COVID-19 after either hospital discharge or recovering at home? Cabinet Secretary. That is not information that I have. Thank you. Beatrice Wishart to be followed by George Adam. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a question for the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Um, I understand that current plans for increasing testing capacity in Shetland involve sending swabs to the mainland, thus delaying the speed of delivery of results. There are two machines in Shetland normally used for testing fish diseases one at Greek Salmon, the other at SSQC. The Cabinet Secretary will no doubt be aware that in Faro, increased testing capacity was achieved using similar equipment. So can I ask what consideration is being given to using equipment like this, where companies are keen to help and support efforts in dealing with coronavirus? And can I urge the Cabinet Secretary to ensure all options for adapting and expanding local infrastructure, for example, with mobile lab units, are fully explored? Cabinet Secretary. So the use of uh, both private and, for example, veterinary and other public agency laboratories is under active consideration as part of the further scale up of our testing capacity that is needed over this month um, in order to be fully ready and fully fully operational in test, trace, isolate, and support. Some of that test and tracing work is, of course, already underway. So we are scaling that up, both in our NHS labs, but also in looking at other public agency labs, as well as the private sector. To do that, we need to ensure that the machines are the machines that are the right ones for the PCR test that we use. That is a test that has 91 per cent accuracy in terms of uh, sensitivity, but also uh, around 90 per cent uh, accuracy in terms of being able to identify this particular virus as opposed to other viruses. So that is the test we want to use. And aside from the machines, of course, there is also the supply of uh, the chemical reagents and uh, other uh, bits of equipment that are necessary uh, to do that. It is not my understanding at this point that we would be expecting swabs from Shetland to uh, come to the mainland in order to be run through the test. My understanding is that we now have labs in all our territorial health boards, uh, but I am happy to check that uh, for the member uh, and also to keep her advised on the progress that we are making in bringing in those, uh, that additional lab capacity. We have, of course, uh, in our uh, scale up to 8,000, which we will be at by round about the middle of next week. That brings in uh, the laboratory capacity from uh, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and Dundee universities, and those universities will themselves uh, scale up from there. In terms of the mobile units, these are part of the four-nation uh, approach, where the laboratory for 
the swabs that they take goes to the Lighthouse uh, Laboratory run by Glasgow University in Glasgow uh, and uh, are not diverted anywhere in the UK to other than the Lighthouse Laboratory. So mobile testing um, is possible, but the swabs from that testing goes to uh, those Lighthouse labs, and it is not possible to divert them. And as I'm sure the member knows, of course, speed of uh, turnaround of the samples to a result is critical in the effectiveness of the approach. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. George Adam to be followed by Brian Whittle. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, it has been reported, Cabinet Secretary, through various media outlets that the UK Government has briefed that they will very soon lift restrictions that are preventing the spread of COVID-19. Has the Scottish Government ministers been formally advised by their UK Government counterparts of any of these proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the answer to that is a straightforward no. We have not. Um, my understanding, I do not know if members had the opportunity to uh, watch the lunchtime briefing uh, that we give uh, every day except Saturday. Uh, in today's, they will have uh, seen the First Minister set out very clearly our current view on the lifting of restrictions, but also to advise uh, uh, watchers, uh, viewers of that briefing, that uh, there is a call later today that uh, the devolved administrations will have with the Prime Minister, and it is our hope at that point that we can begin the collective discussion uh, on a four-nation basis about what our approach might be in easing any of the lockdown measures. I believe Mr Adam wants a brief supplementary. Mr Adam? Yes, thank you, President Officer. Uh, on that point, Cabinet Secretary, you gov the UK Government's plans uh, will make it increasing will it not make it more increasingly difficult for us to maintain a four nation approach uh, of co because of their behaviour? And if the UK government continues down this path, will that not make things even further difficult for us all? Cabinet Secretary. So uh, right at the moment we do not know what the UK government's plans are. What we do know is what we have uh, read in uh, newspapers. Uh, so it is a really important uh, part of our of our shared approach to recognise that if we are to reach a shared approach, we do that by collectively sharing through discussion, and we have that opportunity through, for example, COBRA, but by other means, uh, a shared view of uh, where we all are in suppressing the virus, what the uh, scientific advice is, and we will be led by that here what the scientific and clinical advice is about the impact of easing any of the current lockdown measures, and then where we can reach an agreed view on what those measures would be uh, and be able to do that uh, at the same time, if that is at all possible. But if it is not possible uh, to reach a, the shared view to release those measures at the same time, we would at least agree a coordinated approach. Uh, all of that uh, would reflect how we went into lockdown in the first place, and it would certainly be uh, our desire to see that replicated as we look to, in a phased and gradual way, um, continue uh, our, our steps towards coming out of lockdown with uh, some very clear public health messages, because it is our view, and we have no reason to think this is not the approach of the UK government or our colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland, that the overall uh, objective here remains what it has always been, and that is to suppress the virus, to break the transmission chains, uh, to uh, save lives that could be lost uh, if we are not successful in doing that. We all want a return as far as we can to uh, aspects of a normal life but we need to take those decisions in a way that allows us to continue to keep the virus suppressed, to break the transmission chains, and consequently to save lives. Our view is, if we can reach those considerations collectively across the four nations of the UK, that would be preferable. If we take a different view in different parts of the UK and the different nations about the timing of any of those easements, 
then certainly we should share that through discussion and coordinate the approach. We will see if we can reach that over the coming days. Thank you. Question from Brian Whittle to be followed by Sandra White. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. This question for the Cabinet Secretary. As we uh, ramp up our ability to test, uh, you will be aware that there are a testing, there's a testing facility at Prestwick Airport and also at the Ailsa Hospital. Uh, but the reports are that they've been extremely quiet, which is a worry because, of course, there are essential workers there that will be looking for a test. So, can I ask Cabinet Secretary uh, what has been done to promote those test sites to all those who would be eligible? Cabinet Secretary. So, the, the test site at Presswick Airport is the drive through centre, I believe, which is part of the Four Nation, the, the UK led Four Nation. Uh, mobile and drive-through testing centres where the samples that are taken there go to the Lighthouse Laboratory uh, across the UK, but in Scotland it is in Glasgow. That testing facility is for key workers. That is uh, accessed by the worker or the employer through the UK uh, government-held portal, both for the employee and for the employer, where uh, uh, questions are asked and answered in order to ascertain status, and appointments are then made. So it is a facility where the demand for that is not a demand that we control, uh, but we have uh, made sure that it is understood that it is not only for a wide range of key workers across all our categories that we set out as the Scottish Government, so beyond health and social care, it includes oil and gas, it includes key infrastructure, food, food distribution, and others, but also to those aged over 65 who have symptoms, and to those who are not key workers or in that category, but who cannot stay at home to do their work, and therefore they leave home to work. Uh, so the uh, facility is available to all of those groups, but they access it through the UK government's portals. And a supplementary from Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the answer. I think my point being here that if that facility is available, uh, it's surely within uh, the capabilities of all governments, including the Scottish Government, to ensure that those who are eligible are, know that that facility exists. And I'm just asking what the Scottish Government can do to make sure uh, that happens within uh, uh, the boundaries of Scotland. In so, uh, so I understand that we have. Uh, made it publicly available. We have taken steps to ensure that employers are advised, particularly the employers in those uh, three, I think, categories, possibly four categories of key workers, so that they all know that for their key workers, they can access uh, that testing. Uh, and we have taken some steps to ensure that those over 65 with symptoms and other workers who have to leave home uh, for work but are not in the key workers. Uh, category uh, who have symptoms can also access it and how to do that. Uh, and that will be a continuous process on our behalf, making sure that we use the platforms available to us to ensure that uh, workers and employers who are uh, eligible to use uh, that portal uh, know how to do it and uh, where they wish to can access it. Thank you very much. Just to remind members, there's quite a few members still wish to ask questions, so please keep the questions and the supplementaries and, of course, the answers relatively concise if possible. Sandra White to be followed by Polly McNeill. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is for the CABSEC. Um, CABSEC, you mentioned to an earlier question uh, what the current surge capacity in ICU is. Could you also tell us what high point of occupancy was during this emergency period, and what the occupancy for COVID-19 cases is today? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so today, the number for uh, COVID-19 uh, patients, either with COVID-19 or with suspected COVID-19 in ICU, that's the numbers re reported on today. So that is uh, as at 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, was 86, um, and as I said, the surge capacity was uh, remains uh, 485. We have 435 uh, ICU beds available, 
uh, but the capacity to surge up to 585. Uh, from uh, memory, the, it was over 150 at the highest point, but I am happy to uh, make sure that I double check that figure and advise Ms. White of it. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Polly McNeill to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Polly McNeill. Thank you, Mr. Heading Officer. Uh, my question is to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Um, Cabinet Secretary, be aware that uh, the press covered widely the issue of dental practices, and many are struggling and fear that they might be bankrupt because they're not getting the support that they need. Uh, I don't need to say that Scotland has made, has made great strides in eradicating tooth decay, particularly amongst children. So it's a concern that post the lockdown, um, if they lose practices from the sector. Uh, also, there's many people that are suffering acute pain, desperate to get to a dentist. So my question is, um, are you aware that Sweden, Norway and Switzerland have already opened dental practices? And have you had a look at this to see if they've had a workaround and what workaround they've been using? And if the, the minister could tell me specifically uh, what plans uh, any details she can tell me as to what kind of workarounds they're looking at. Um, I, I suppose the big fear is that if we don't have some planning in the long term, we're going to lose dentists and not every citizen will have access to a dentist. And I think that's a real concern for us all. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. I would agree um, with the member that um, we certainly have made significant strides in Scotland in uh, access to NHS dental care and to the level of dental health in both adults, but particularly in children. And so I would share her concern that we don't go backwards in that regard. Uh, we have made uh, financial support available to dental practices to uh, assist them during a period, uh, particularly those who uh, charge fees or receive fees from the NHS to assist them during a period where they are not able to practice. In terms of individuals who have uh, who are suffering pain, uh, dental pain, uh, then we do we did set up and still have emergency dental hubs that individuals can access, which are uh, staffed by, uh, of course, uh, highly qualified dentists who will undertake emergency treatment and pain relief treatment. Um, the reopening of dental practices and what might be the measures that would be put in place in order to do that safely. Uh, there would be two areas uh, distinct, I think. One is absolutely to ensure physical distancing, so that probably has an implication about appointment times and the numbers uh, of patients a dentist could see, but also uh, the supply of PPE where dentists are, and they very often are, in particular hygienists, engaging in aerosol-generated practice. Then uh, the, su the supply of PPE, making sure that was available, would be at least two important mitigating measures to ensure we're in place before we moved to that uh, route. However, uh, consideration of the reopening of dental practices is part of the work that is right now underway, uh, both dental practices but also uh, optometry uh, practices in the community, and of course screening. Uh, which a um, member has raised with me before, are all part of the considerations that we have uh, underway and are working on uh, to see uh, what we can do in a phased way, in a safe way, to restart areas of healthcare that have been paused in order to deal with the pandemic. And in doing that, we will be consulting with uh, the Royal Colleges, of course, with the BMA, the RCN, with the unions, but also with uh, the dental associations and others. Thank you. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Annie Wells. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, okay. Presiding Officer, um, for the Health Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, I think some of the most difficult aspects around this are around the sort of emotional side of it. I hear from constituents who are worried about loneliness and isolation, who have relatives in care homes or shielding. Now, earlier in the week, there was an estimate from Epi Forecasts Unit in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine that the R rate in the UK was actually 1.1. So, th there's two things I'd, I'd like to hear. Firstly, I suppose reassurance that when we are in a place that we're able to alter or ease restrictions, that 
um, our older population and people who are labelled as vulnerable will be at the centre of these decisions. They're, they'll be taken into account. But also, importantly, why the R rate needs to be well below one for us to do that. What's so important about that? Cabinet Secretary. So the, the R rate is essentially the rate of transmission, and it's about um, if I had uh, the virus, uh, if an R, if the R rate was at three, then I would infect three people. Those three people would then infect another three people, and so on. It goes exponentially. Um, the estimate broadly is at the start of the pandemic, our R rate uh, here in Scotland was above three. There is some debate about how far above three it was, but it was certainly above three. So, therefore, if you can bring the R rate down, and the lockdown measures have significantly reduced those, uh, reduced that number, because the vast majority of the people in Scotland have followed all the instructions and the advice that we have given them about staying at home, about keeping that physical distance of two metres, about not mixing households and only going out for those essential purposes, as well as the criticality of good hand hygiene and good respiratory hygiene, the, the number has come down, and the estimate is that it is below one. Uh, it may be 0 0.7, but it is certainly not lower than 0 0.7. So, the more you can suppress the transmission rate, the reproduction rate, if you like, of the virus, then the greater room you, you give yourself to ease measures, which may see a slight increase in the R number, but the health service can still cope, and we use test, trace, and isolate to capture those outbreaks and suppress it again. So the job in all of this is to, um, if you like, capture where the virus is and break all the transmission routes. Um, uh, it's been described as making sure there are no bridges for transmission between one person and another. So that's why the R number needs to be lower than it currently is, and why we need to see uh, some more uh, days and weeks' worth of data to assure us that we are um, persistently seeing a downward trend in case numbers, in ICU numbers, and importantly, in the numbers of deaths. This week was the first week where we saw a reduction in the number of deaths. Uh, that will always be the last figure to be reduced. So you could see case numbers come down, ICU numbers come down, but the last one, if you like, in, in time terms, to come down will be the death rate. Now, I absolutely understand that for those who are in the highest risk that we have asked to isolate and uh, uh, described as shielding, uh, that is a, a very, very hard ask that we are making of those individuals indeed. But it is there because they are at the most serious clinical risk if they contract the virus and therefore at the most serious risk of death if they contract the virus. The other group, those who are over 70, those who uh, currently are eligible for the flu jab and so on, um, also face a risk, but not as great as those who are in the shielding group. For all of those individuals, uh, what we're asking them to do is very hard. And of course, mental well-being, loneliness, isolation uh, will compound uh, that situation for them. The Minister for Mental Health has made a series of um, important steps to ensure that the digital tools are there for people to help them with their mental health and well-being, uh, invested in, in order to make sure that happens, invested in particular areas to make sure that telephone helplines are manned for longer uh, and that the support is there for people. And today, I was able to uh, also announce an additional five million to assist those individuals who do not either have the equipment uh, or uh, the confidence or the knowledge to use those digital platforms. And we think that will uh, assist a significant number of people across the country. They will be given uh, an iPad or a tablet. They will be given a digital buddy, uh, if you like, to help them. They'll be given training. 
so that they can access all that support as well. And as we uh, consider what options we might uh, take to ease uh, the lockdown measures, then those two groups of people will be very much in our uh, front of our consideration about what we might do that makes uh, matters a bit easier for them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Now, I appreciate these are detailed and very helpful answers. However, I'm very conscious we have five more members at least who want to ask questions, uh, and we have got very little time left. Annie Wells, be followed by David Torrance. Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. It's a question for the Cabinet Secretary. One of my constituents is recovering from breast cancer in 2018. She receives a bone infusion every six months, but unfortunately, the latest treatment has been postponed by four months. I understand it is difficult to establish a firm timeline at this moment, but could the Cabinet Secretary give people waiting for cancer treatments an indication of when some of these treatments will resume? Cabinet Secretary. It is regrettably not possible for me to give a definite timeline at this point. That will come from the work I have already described, but I, I do need to say that postponing uh, particular areas of treatment for cancer patients, for example, are clinical decisions that um, those uh, best placed to make those decisions with the patient uh, make. My job is to uh, ensure that uh, we start up the facilities and the opportunities for uh, that treatment where it has been postponed to continue. But at the end of the day, it will always be a clinical decision about whether or not a treatment progresses or doesn't. Thank you. David Torrance to be followed by Neil Bibby. David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Um, my question is for the Cabinet Secretary. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what work NHS boards in Scotland have been asked to undertake to allow for a resumption of a wider range of activities in the future? Cabinet Secretary. All, all boards have been asked um, to consider uh, how they could restart uh, areas that are currently paused. This is a, a very complex exercise that has to be undertaken. Members may be aware from the scientific advice around a range of options, some of which was published today uh, on our website. One of the options of easement includes restarting areas of the health service. But we have to take a number of factors into consideration. Very briefly, social distancing measures, the demand of a particular procedure on lab capacity when we need the labs to do test, trace, and isolate, uh, where we can uh, uh, deliver those healthcare facilities. So the, the consideration is right across primary care through into acute. Uh, and all of that work is underway. I hope that uh, at some point in the next week to 10 days, I will be able to set out most definitely the factors that are being considered and the criteria and the views from the professional and other bodies that we will engage in this, uh, but also some of the options that we are looking at and how we will take decisions against those options. And again, at that point, very happy to discuss that with members. Thank you. Neil Bibby to be followed by Finlay Carson. Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My question is for the Cabinet Secretary. Coronavirus is not the level of some say it is. I'm sorry to say that according to the latest NRS figures, Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire and Renfrewshire, all in my region, have the highest death rates in Scotland. Amongst the first care workers to die in Scotland was from Western Bartonshire. The first health care worker to die was from Inverclyde. Twenty two people have died at the Eldersley Care Home in Paisley. As you know, Cabinet Secretary, I have previously written to you about reports that testing in the west of Scotland has been described, compared to others, as, uh, by a care provider as hopeless. Does the Cabinet Secretary know why the west of Scotland appears to be disproportionately affected by this virus? If not, will she investigate why? And crucially, what additional resources will be made available to those areas reporting a death rate in excess of the national average? Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. So th this is a very important question and one that does concern us greatly. Of course, uh, I have never thought that the virus would affect all of us equally. Um, the uh, health inequalities that people across Scotland suffer 
often uh, health inequalities that are significantly exacerbated, if not caused by income inequality, um, will play a part in an individual's capacity to withstand the virus in the same way as uh, age uh, does and other clinical conditions. We have asked uh, Public Health Scotland to take an active look at uh, these figures and the factors that may be contributing to them and advise us as to uh, their conclusions on that, and that work is underway. Uh, what we have made clear to the relevant health board is that if there are additional resources that they believe is required to assist them to ensure that they are tackling what is uh, needed in the areas, then they should make sure that we understand that and know that and can assist them. And of course, if the member has particular uh, propositions that he wants to make about how uh, services could be scaled up and, and what would be the evidence to support that, then I am always happy to look at that. Thank you very much. Finlay Carson to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. My question is for the Minister for Mental Health, Claire Hohey. Um, the Minister may know that 20% of women are affected by mental health illness during pregnancy, pregnancy or in the 12 months after giving birth. These can include anxiety and depression, postpartum psychosis and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I declare an interest as being an expectant father and would like to put in record my thanks for organisations like Dad Rock for providing online antenatal and postnatal workshops for dads. However, my partner, my constituency, and the feedback from that forum is that there is little or very little mental health support during or after pregnancy. During this pandemic, the feeling of anxiety and depression will be magnified substantially, particularly with some routine scans and appointments cancelled. And when it all ends, I fear pregnant women and mums still won't get the support they need. Does the Health Minister recognise that this is a problem? And if so, what are the Scottish Government doing right now to support expectant and new mothers' mental health? And what is in place to support them after the lockdown? Thank you. Minister for Mental Health, Claire Hockey. Well, thank, uh, fin I thank Finlay Carson very much for bringing up this uh, very important issue and, uh, and an issue that is extremely close to my own heart, um, given that I um, come from a background of working in perinatal mental health. Mr Carson might remember that the First Minister launched a, a £50 million programme for improving perinatal mental health care right across the country um, in last year. And uh, As part of that uh, investment in perinatal mental health, um, earlier this week we also announced um, a fund which Inspiring Scotland is uh, administering for third sector organisations to ensure that there is help and support for women and their families right across the country. In addition to that, our um, uh, maternity units have specialist midwives who work in the area of perinatal mental health. We have uh, invested heavily in our mother and baby units across the country and in perinatal mental health community teams, including in his own region of Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you very much. And a final question from Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My question is for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, obviously, we're continuing to see cases, 215 cases uh, reported today. What, if anything, do we know about the source of these infections uh, and who is being infected? Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. So, at, at the moment, what we do know about the about who is being infected is that it is following, if you like, the the uh, expectation of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, what is interesting, though, is that in the early days of our understanding of this virus from uh, scientific and clinical advisers, remembering, I'm not quite sure what day we're at, but it's somewhere between 130 and 140 days. Uh, so it's a very young new virus to all of us. But what was estimated at that time was that um, it would be the older generations uh, that would be uh, most likely to be infected and to become ill. And what we are seeing is that is not strictly true. We are seeing individuals in their 40s and 50s and younger who are uh, hospitalised as a consequence of the virus. 
in some instances, and Public Health Scotland will be uh, looking at this, that may be as a consequence of other health conditions uh, that make those individuals more vulnerable to the uh, impact of the virus. Uh, but at this point, uh, the virus is by and large um, working in a way that we anticipated it would. Certainly, uh, its uh, infectiousness is significant, and certainly the other area that is emerging is the potential long-term damage that it does, particularly to respiratory and to renal areas in those individuals, in some individuals at this point, who survive uh, the virus itself. And again, work is underway to try and understand that better and understand what those longer term conditions might be. And Andy Whiteman, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, briefly, what do we actually know about how these people are picking up infections, given that we've been in lockdown for six weeks? Do we know anything about that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, not everyone has been in lockdown, of course, and we reckon that the compliance rate uh, with all the measures is around about 60 per cent, which is what we uh, modelled it on being. Um, and so other individuals um, may be in contact with people who are uh, symptomatic, or uh, we also now know this has also changed since the very early days. Uh, in the very early days, the expectation was that uh, people who did not have symptoms uh, may be infected, but they would not be infectious. Uh, that uh, understanding is changing, uh, and consequently, some of our testing regimes are changing too. What we do know is the virus is transmitted through uh, droplets that are expelled uh, from our mouths or from our noses. And uh, you would contract it, I would contract it, if uh, any of those droplets entered uh, me via my mouth, my eyes, or my nose. And uh, that's why, for example, hand hygiene is so important, because you can also uh, pick up that virus from surfaces. And uh, depending on the surface, the virus can last on the surface for up to 72 hours. So those hygiene measures, those very basic hygiene measures, are really critical in breaking the transmission chain, as is that distance, that two metres, which is uh, estimated to be the best distance to keep in order to ensure that if you are speaking to anyone and they uh, do have the infection, that the, the droplets will not reach you. Um, so we know how it is transmitted, and therefore what we need to do is as much as we possibly can individually, collectively, and as a government and a health service to break those transmission chains. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And can I thank all uh, members for taking part and ministers for taking part today. Parliament will resume in Holyrood in Edinburgh on Tuesday at two o'clock. But uh, from me and from all our colleagues, can I say thank you very much and I close this session.